Wi-Fi Sheep would like to say a huge thank you to all of you that kindly support us. Help us continue to bring new videos like this. Join patreon.com forward slash Wi-Fi Sheep from just $1 a month. Hello everyone and welcome back to another Wi-Fi Sheep tech video with me, Tom. Now, I don't know if I'm having an early midlife crisis or if it's a result of this extended lockdown during this uh, troubling time at the beginning of 2020, but I found myself buying an original Nintendo NES system. Now, I've never owned an NES. I remember them when they were a current system back in the day. And yes, I have the more modern classic edition and boy, does that mini console look small against the original hardware. And for those of you that are regular to the channel will also remember that I have a quite advanced RetroPie system set up. So I'm not short of systems able to play these kind of games, but for me there's nothing quite like the original 8-bit hardware. So I don't regret actually buying this system and I think I got a relatively good deal off eBay. It cost me about £70, including postage and packings, that's around US dollars And for that I got two working controllers, a working-ish system in relatively good condition, we'll come back to that, and I got a loose copy of Super Mario Bros. 3 on cartridge, which works perfectly fine. So yeah, I don't think it was overall a bad deal. However, there are some issues, and we'll come into that, which means we're gonna to have to probably strip the console down and right back and start working from PCB level upwards. Speaking of PCBs, have you seen our latest PCB project which has been made possible thanks to our partners at PCBWay.com? If you need high quality, inexpensive, professionally made printed circuit boards, then look no further than PCBWay.com. In our recent video, I uploaded a custom Gerber file to my free PCBWay user account and then went through the whole online ordering process. Within less than two weeks, the finished PCBs were with me, ready for assembly. So go and check out that video, and don't forget to register for your free account with PCBWay.com. Okay, so let's take a look at the unit I've bought. On the side, you can see the RCA ports for composite video and mono audio. And on the back, we've got the 9V AC main in, and a third RCA jack used for UHF RF out. One thing I did notice was the distinct yellowing on the front door and the power and reset buttons. It's odd the rest of the unit seems fine, which makes me wonder if this is actually a parts machine. Looking underneath, we can see there's no helpline labels, but the never used expansion slot cover is still intact. A quick look at the one label present and this NES's serial number for those that are interested. This is the mains AC adapter, which I think is earlier than the NES unit. You can tell by the now illegal mains 3-pin plug used here in the UK. If I get a legal 3-pin plug, you can see the lower pins are plastic sleeves to stop you accidentally electrocuting yourself when you wrap your fingers around to pull it out of the socket. So this is an easy fix to fit a new plug, and as it's a British plug, it needs the correct fuse fitting inside. OK, let's go for a test. The PAL UK NES had the extra NES version text on the front door. Now I'm going to use a two-way RCA phono lead for a video and one mono audio output. I'll plug the other ends into this SCART adapter, this one being an official Microsoft branded one off an Xbox 360. Let's try one of the controllers out. The NES having these proprietary 7-pin plugs. Still, no worse or better than the Wii style connectors used on the NES Classic. Oh, how we longed for a standard USB. Back to the full size, and we'll try the included Super Mario Bros. 3 cartridge, which loads like an old VCR machine, which is kind of the point of the NES's design. Let's hit the power button, and the blinking red light of death, with a blue screen of death to boot. Okay, so clearly we've got some issues with this thing, which were expected and aren't exactly uncommon. Uh, so I think the best thing we need to do is take it apart, as I really do want to get these parts off for retro writing. First things first, make sure it hasn't got a cartridge in. Just 
one still has, we'll take that out. And we'll flip the console onto its front or back, whichever way around you want to call it. Bring a mouse mat down just for a soft surface so I don't scratch the top of the unit up. Now, luckily with these things, they actually use standard crosshead Phillips style screwdrivers, which is not common for Nintendo products. I think this is one of the only Nintendo consoles that actually did use stock screws, but hopefully we can very quickly just take the screws out. Okay, so we can lift the top off. And it says, uh, not an awful lot of uh, stuff in here really. It's mostly just um, RF shields and empty space. So inside it's still pretty much standard type screw fixings. I think there's actually the same type of screw. Okay, that's a very, very thin piece of pressed aluminium, I think, or aluminum, as they'd say in the States. And that takes that shield off. And this is the actual cartridge loading mechanism inside. Part of the uh, slightly flawed design with the NES. So, can we lift that out now? There we go. So that's the mechanism. You can actually see the PCB in this is mounted upside down and this is the edge connector that the cartridge plugs into and it's basically a U-shaped device that then plugs into another edge connector on the side of the PCB. So with all the screws out I should be able to just lift this straight up. Bearing in mind we have a lot of these Connectors and to try and take out the best we can. There we go. Okay. So because this has all been unscrewed, this additional shield lifts off another piece of folded pressed aluminium. And here is the main logic board for an NES. You can actually tell this is a later revision because it's copyright 1987 on this board, not the 1985. And you can also see here the PAL, which means it's a British machine. All the US ones and all the ones you usually see on YouTube will have NTSC on the sticker. This is definitely a PAL machine. And then this is the edge connector for the cartridges. And it's actually just a friction fit. A very tight friction fit. Oh, there we go. Pop that down there. And here is this U-shaped connector I was telling you about. So the bottom part is obviously what fitted on the PCB. There are all your pin array. And then the top part is where your cartridge locks, and that's possibly where we're having a problem. So now it's looking pretty clean. Not looking too bad. You can get replacements of these, but I'm not sure that's a problem as yet. But uh, we'll put that to one side. Okay, so this is the uh, switch array. And there's two screws holding this on. One of them has got this cable tie holding the wires on, and the screw is right underneath the... Uh, Oh, I might be able to get to it. Just put the right screwdriver. At least we're actually getting to the bottom of the uh, date on this. So, 1987. I still think it's either a parts machine, potentially. Or it's a 1990 unit, perhaps. So can we now, yes we can, we can take that PCB back. And we can pop the buttons off.
Okay, so next stop is to clean the parts for retro brighting. I'm going to use this domestic grease remover. And we'll use a damp cloth to remove any dirt. Before giving all the parts a rinse under the tap to remove any remaining residue. Let's head outside. It's been an unusually sunny spring for my part of England, so a good time to take full advantage. I'm going to set up a small trestle table in the back garden. One, to keep stuff off the ground and away from pollen and dust. And two, to stop any curious wildlife or domestic livestock from getting involved. Now, my Retro Bright method involves using small amounts of one-shot hydrogen peroxide cream, usually used in salons for hair bleaching. The advantage here is you can simply paint the peroxide onto the parts before placing them into a translucent white bin liner or bag. I find using bin liners as opposed to cling film wrap helps in giving an even exposure and prevents lines and marks being etched into the plastic parts. We'll just use a brick or stone to keep the bin bag from blowing away and come back in a few hours. Okay, so with the case uh, cooking outside, let's take a closer look at the PAL European NES board. Now I've looked on the internet at the more common NTSC North American NES and there seem to be some differences on the PCB. For starters, this is a later revision, so it's copyright 1987 Nintendo. And although the layout is fundamentally the same, I've noticed that some chips like the two RAM chips here are completely different sizes, completely different chips. Um, so let's have a closer look at what we've got going on then. So you'll notice the PAL sticker as opposed to NTSC. Uh, now the two RAM chips I've already talked about, now these are Gold Star branded and I think they're still 2K each. This thing had practically no RAM in it, which is astonishing. We've got here, this is the 6502 based CPU and this is the PPU based chip. Now this was clocked at nearly 2 megahertz. I think it was 1.6 something megahertz for PAL. The PAL version ran a little bit slower than the North American NTSC one which is 1.7 megahertz I think. Um, now I've been looking into the 6502 variant that's used here and unfortunately this chip is not cross compatible with a stock 6502. I'll just show you this chip now this is a stock 6502 processor this is actually a clone uh, Cinetech or Sinotech chip that we used in the 6502 uh, manual wiring video uh, if you remember that video I've got a link to it here in the description um, so this is a stock chip from BBC Micro and this is the NES chip and pin for pin they're identical pin to pin so the chip is the same but this custom 6502 package actually contains the sound generation used for the console whereas the stock chip doesn't so I'm imagining the pin uh, IO is going to be different on this chip. The problem is that although you can get hold of these relatively easily you can even get hold of new versions of these chips this custom chip used in the NES is problematic to get hold of as is the PPU this is the picture processing chip or the video chip both chips are coupled to their own designated RAM. Um, so going forward, how reliable these are going to be? So when these parts fail, it's not like we can get off-the-shelf replacements. But it's interesting to see that the chip actually isn't any bigger, and it has exactly the same 40-pin pinout. Um, it's just obviously that whatever the connections are inside is going to be different. I also noticed some Motorola branded parts. Most of these are going to be uh, TTL or Glue Logic. Uh, mainly for things like the controller inputs, the controllers are inputs are here. Uh, but we do have one custom chip here. This is the infamous CIC lockout chip, and this prevented, in our case, NTSC cartridges from running on this PAL European system and vice versa. These chips have a habit of going wrong because they're custom, they seem to go wrong a lot easier than anything else on the board, and it can be part of the reason we get the flashing light where the system just constantly resets itself because this chip can't make a decent connection so it 
uh, basically doesn't allow the system to run, it just keeps resetting and resetting the CPU. Now we can do a very simple and well documented mod, which I'm gonna do to disable this chip. Right, so this chip is absolutely tiny. Um, and we can see we've got this ceramic disc capacitor in the way, so we're gonna just try and pull that back. So we can reveal the pins and we want to cut pin four. Some people desolder the chip altogether, some people take it out, put it back in. I am just going to try and make a cut on pin four. So the circle here denotes one. So it's one, two, three, and there is pin four just there. So, and this is going to be very difficult. I've got these wire cut tin snippers. You've seen me use these before. Um, so I'm just gonna see if I can actually take out the pin. And this is going to be very, very tricky to do. Okay, so put up a little bit of a fight, but we've now managed to get pin four here, just cut and lifted up. While we've got the board, I think we'll just give these connectors a clean. Uh, you can use uh, rubbing alcohol or electronics cleaner to do it. I like to use one of these uh, glass fiber brushes and it, you can literally just clean up the metal. too bad at all of course not forgetting as it's an edge connector to do the other side okay so let's uh, see if we can get this thing back together I'll just give this a quick final brush down well, that's relatively clean inside all right let's try again to get the main assembly back in just remembering before we do that we need to put the plugs back okay before we go any further with the assembly because there's quite a few screws to put back in I think it might be valid to just do a quick test just to see if it's actually alive. Because there's nothing more you'd want to do than put it all back together then find you've got a problem. So let's try putting Super Mario back in. Okay, Okay, it's slightly over tightened, it bent this part forward, so there we are, that's one problem solved. Let's power on, see what happens. Oh, there we go. That seems all right. Apart from that, a little bit of corruption, so probably still need a bit of a clean somewhere. But overall, that's actually now much more reliable than it was with that lockout chip installed. So yeah, that's great. So it's been about four hours. Let's see how our yellowed plastic parts are doing. And yeah, I think they're about done. So just need to thoroughly rinse any peroxide residue off. And after fully drying, we can reunite the case door with the main shell. And the color is a perfect match once more. So just need to refit the tension springs to hold the door in place. With the other outer trim refitted, the two halves of the case can be reunited. And with it back together, one final test of Mario 3. Just because the amount of times things stop working the minute you put the case all back together. Happy to report, all working fine, still. One final thing I wanted to try is to test the RF modulator out. The RF out jack is on the back of the NES and looks like an audio RCA jack but it's not. I'm going to plug into one of my small black and white CRT portables into its aerial in socket. So let's see if you can tune a picture. In the background you can see the LCD TV with the composite video out. 
The NES is capable of outputting BIS and RF at the same time. So it might be a bad RF modulator or the poor quality of its late 90s CRT set, but I'm sort of getting a picture. The sound is also coming from the RF and you can hear a lot of buzz on the channel. When I try level, you can see the CRT loses sync and needs retuning. Even then, there is still some distortion on screen. Still an interesting and nostalgic novelty for those of us that grew up in the analog CRT age. So there you have it, the British PAL version of the iconic Nintendo Entertainment System, the classic 80s gaming console. If you're new to retro computer hardware, or just want a piece of classic 8-bit memorabilia, then I can recommend no better than the original NES. There's still plenty of them around, you can still get them at a reasonably good price, and of course the game library for these things is fantastic. Plus they're easy to maintain, and they don't generally go wrong too much, and when they do, you can fix them. So, highly recommended, and I seriously do not regret buying mine. Well, that's all we've got time for in this video, so I hope you enjoyed. If you haven't done already, please do like and subscribe just here on Wi-Fi Sheep. And as ever, I will see you real soon. Stay safe, stay well. Until next time, bye for now.